I'm Jim Wyckoff. I think I know most of you. I'm a professor in the Curry School of Education. And this is part of the Education Policy Seminar Series sponsored by the Bankard Foundation. Each semester, Ed Policy Works hosts a number of talks that are open to the public. For more information, please see our webpage. I am really delighted and a bit lucky, this the way this worked out, to have Tim Sass here today. Tim is a distinguished university professor in the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University. He's also a senior researcher at the Center for the Analysis of Longitudinal Data in Education Research, Calder. Tim has published widely on a variety of topics in education policy, including work of immediate policy relevance, such as charter schools, teacher preparation, and peer effects. Tim has also made some important contributions methodologically to our understanding of value-added models and other areas as well. Most of Tim's work is supported by uh, grants that are from very competitive sources like IES. You know, I, I got to know Tim a, a number of years ago and my sort of, when I think of Tim, I think of someone who really pioneered the use of longitudinal data um, for education policy. And I think Tim can correct me if I've gotten this wrong, but Tim was using longitudinal data in Florida before there was a Florida data warehouse, if I'm correct in that. So, in many ways, I think the way the Florida Data Warehouse sort of developed was a result of some of the early work that Tim had done. Tim is going to present a, a new paper where he's examining the effects of test score manipulation on students' subsequent educational outcomes. Please join me in welcoming Tim Sass. Manipulation by teachers and administrators. And 
throughout and we prefer this as succeeding, but it's not just classroom teachers. Uh, it could be principals, assistant principals, uh, other school administrators. And uh, the case we'll look at today, this is a uh, unnamed school district, and I'll be able to figure out who it is, but promise no name and age, um, where teacher speech occurred on a large scale uh, and was clearly documented. So um, we have a, a somewhat unique case where we have an opportunity to look at a situation where there was shared efforts of two really good tracks people at the time trying to determine what the impact of the speech was. And as you may from Cheryl's talk on, on training and comments and unique interruptions that create and what questions that speak up, uh, a warning for me as we get to the end and share our questions. So please, as we go along, classrooms, so fairly low. Uh, there have been a handful of uh, reports of sort of massive cheating uh, uh, that went on. Um, there was a study our local newspaper in Atlanta did just looking at publicly available test score data and looking at kind of unusual changes. And that suggested that um, there's potential cheating in a large I mean, like over 100 school districts where they found unusual test score changes year on year. So hard to know, but it could be actually a, a wider problem than you think. So I suspect not as many cases as we're as uh, involved as we'll see here today in this district. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about just the, uh, I guess the premise of the question? Sorry, the premise of the question because um, so let's say we find that teaching isn't bad for students. Is it okay? You know, I'm just trying to figure out, so we're trying to figure out if cheating has effects on student outcomes. Um, because if it's bad for student outcomes, we shouldn't do it. If it's good for student outcomes, we should. I, 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 was, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm being a little facetious, but I'm trying to kind of understand the, um, you know, kind of what does this tell us about implications given that we're focusing on student outcomes, not just, you know, should this happen or not? Um, and one motivation is, well, but does it really matter to the students? Yeah, we don't want the teachers to cheat, but if it happens, is it, is it really good to the students? Um, and um, I think with this paper, we're just trying to measure the impact. There's lots of other things related to this that we can do, like um, are there certain characteristics of cheaters or teachers that can make them more likely to cheat? Is it, is it the weaker teachers, or is it the high-value-added teachers? Um, I may again talk a little bit about uh, the intervention that this district is um, going to be taking to uh, deal with the impact of students on students. We have some ideas that I might like to uh, take a look at that. So uh, there might be some side benefits of evaluating the mediation program. Um, finally, uh, quite honestly, it was an intellectual interest of, uh, there's been all this talk in this district depression about the teachers and administrators involved, and uh, who was going to be tried and this and that, but no one ever talked about the students. And so I thought it was appropriate to say, well, let's see what happens to the students. So there's a lot of talk about, oh, we're ruining the lives of the students. We really didn't know. Um, so let me give you uh, a little timeline. Uh, uh, we'll we'll reveal who this is. But, um, so later uh, investigations determined that cheating went on in this district as far back as 2001. On the, the 
criterion reference exam, which was um, the state high state exam. Um, it turns out that uh, for a three year period, um, the district also gave a low stakes norm reference test, like you know, the national norm reference exam. Um, and this is where part of Jeremy Perry's hard work came in. Uh, they were deputized as uh, non data employees of the district, uh, given complete access to the data files of the district, and they uncovered a data on a warm reference test that the district didn't even know they had. Uh, they, they found it in the form of the server. Um, so there was a uh, test, the high stakes test, grades one through eight, um, uh, dating back to the uh, early 2000s. Um, and then in addition, had this low stakes test uh, from 2006 to 2008. Um, and then in fall of 2009, the local newspaper reports improbable score increases on the spring 2009 high stakes exam. This then led to a statewide investigation by the state agency um, where they went back and reprocessed all the exams using specialized standards from the uh, test administrator. Um, that would allow them to detect the ratios and flagged classrooms where the count of ratios was greater than three fifth standard deviations from the um, state average. So think about your bell curve, three standard deviations, there's a minute probability that the truth is, is uh, zero. So uh, using that three standard deviation standard, they Flag classrooms. Um, monitors were then sent into uh, schools for the spring 2010 uh, administration exam. And uh, as the Italian paper would predict, uh, uh, scores changed. Uh, we'll see that in a moment. Um, but then also, um, after the initial analysis of erasures, there was an investigation where. Um, Schools that had multiple uh, flag classrooms. Uh, the State Bureau of Investigation went in, interviewed people, um, got detailed information. Uh, I think something over half the people involved confessed uh, to wrongdoing. Um, and so we have some at least um, uh, evidence of of the, the cheating and what kinds of cheating went on and so forth. So over 60% uh, of the schools in the district um, were investigated and the, the final report concluded that over three quarters of these investigated schools uh, did in fact have systemic cheating. So, uh, but did they, uh, presumably the students didn't know the cheating was going on? And uh, yes and no. Okay. So, um, I'll talk about it in more detail in a minute, but there were some uh, instances of teachers outright giving answers uh, during the exam, so that would uh, yeah. students that didn't, didn't get what they were doing. Um, but also, probably a lot didn't know because a lot of the cheating occurred after the administration. And that was another question I had is if they're giving the answers, you wouldn't might not, might not show up in the erasure data, right? Because it's right, yeah. Okay, and then the last one. So, um, did the students find out these scores? So, did they? If in mean, the cases where they didn't know that this cheating was going on, did the students think they were doing better than they actually were? Yeah. So, so I mean, um, as is typical, I mean, if you uh, have kids that are taking standardized exams, I mean, you do get reported back to parents. Of, Here's the percentile. Uh, the student falls into their median state benchmark. So. Um, I was wondering, um, <laughs> uh, I was wondering, when did schools find out that they were being flagged or investigated? So did they know when s state monitors were sent that they were under investigation for cheating? Did um, they? Yes, yeah, so it was, um, the, the erasure analysis occurred early in 2010. Okay. 
So, um, if I remember correctly, um, that information would have uh, been known by the, the Spring 2010. The actual report of the full investigation came later. Okay. All right. So I was just wondering. Schools aware of the fact that state monitors came to specifically well, oversue them because okay. Yeah. So there were people coming in making sure the tests were secure and, and so forth. It was not so. Tim, did the students find out the results of the analysis of their tests? So my the analysis showed that there are fifty percent. I don't know fifty percent of my answers were erased with right to wrong wrong to right answers did I was I ever told that I just so as a student what do I know about the extent to which I may have been cheated by my teacher right. so, uh, the individual race of data was not like this. in fact we were the first to do that and the, the district actually was happy that occurred um, the only thing the students would have known is that their test score plus uh, and we, we try to take advantage of that in some of the analysis. Uh, but that would be the only direct signal other than you heard the teacher give you the answer that there was cheating going on. What kind of accountability pressure were schools or teachers facing here? Or you may be about to tell us that. Uh, it just seems so high. And I wonder, you know, if it's different from the norm or... Uh, well, so there, um, this um, district, there were some teacher bonuses available tied to test score performance. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but it's fairly low, we were like $2,500, $3,000. Um, what many of those investigators said was, was there was huge pressure from school administrators that you have to hit certain benchmarks. That, um, alleged that the superintendent was pressuring school leaders to hit certain benchmarks of X percent of your students being proficient or C proficient. Um, and there was then pressure on teachers to hit those goals. And they had said that there was, just, there was no way that was going to happen. And that led to the two. Um, so if you do wonder, well, really cheating to get a $2,500 bonus. Um, from what I can tell, the motivation was really they were concerned about losing their job. That uh, there was many allegations of school leaders threatening teachers, you get your score dropped for Well, here gives you a, uh, a sense of the magnitude of cheating. So, yeah. The, the blue line is um, class, students in classes were flagged for cheating. That the, the classroom erasures were greater than the standardizations of the uh, statewide average. And that's their 2009 scores. Um, in comparison, the, the green are 2009 flagged classrooms for next year's scores. So you can compare the blue to the green and see a huge shift. And in fact, the, the green, the um, scores in those class, uh, students in those classrooms look very much like um, the scores in 2009 or 2010 of students that weren't in the right classroom. So, and the, the difference is about half a standard deviation. So these were not small changes. And, you know, if you think about policy interventions, something that moves test scores so uh, these were these were big changes in test scores. So in the green area, is that supposed to be the distribution of population? Is that the uh, yeah, so it's kind of uneven. I mean, that's one of the, the problems we face is until it's 2009 where we have the ratio data. Hard to know just by looking at the scores uh, who's being cheated and who's not. Um, so, uh, uh, here's some descriptives. Um, so, looking at uh, 
um, schools that had one or more of their classroom flagged versus schools that had no classroom flag for higher issues. Um, the non flag uh, schools without flag classrooms tend to be whiter, uh, richer, uh, but about the same um, achievement level. So, this is a, uh, a district, as you can see, with a uh, large African American population, uh, but there is some variation in terms of uh, different schools uh, serving relatively more, more white students or relatively more African -American. So you mentioned that these flag classrooms are people that were three standard deviations above um, what we would expect, right? So I'm wondering, do you have any evidence of the people who might be a little bit less blatant about it, people who are two standard, you know, do you have a sense of whether there was a lot more, whether this was really more widespread in a more subtle form or anything like that? Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll get more, a little more detail, but we actually don't use the flag classrooms as a definition of cheating. Uh, we actually base it on the distribution of wrong and right ratios in the non-cheating year. Um, but it actually lines up pretty closely with these flag classrooms. So, um, um, but getting into this graph, and partly because it's an issue too, is that within uh, schools that had one or more classes flagged, there was quite a distribution. So some schools, it was virtually every classroom, and some just a handful, where they typically they fall in sort of the 28% range. But it wasn't that every single classroom had scores in the Atlantic. Um, it did vary. like uh, I know in some districts they have like call-in lines where people can make anonymous reports of potential cheating things so like the that. initial flagging was just based solely on the ratios but then that led to the secondary investigation and so like I think there was one school where they had one classroom flag but there was uh, no evidence of any improprieties and they, they didn't get a full investigation uh, but all the others there was this investigation with interviews and so forth. And um, so this was kind of triggered to that deeper investigation. Tim, I, yeah. I take it that the teachers who monitor the test are the classroom teachers of the students? Sorry. The classrooms? Um, not entirely. So, um, and the footnote tucked in the paper that um, while we talk about flag classrooms, these were actually flagged groups of students with the same monitor. Much like North Carolina, most of them were classroom teachers, but not all, so we have some that were the, the media specialists. Um, so um, when we layer the analysis, we have like classroom fixed effects and such, that's the actual uh, classroom they're enrolled in. These quote classes are groups of students that were at a particular proctor uh, for the exam purposes. So, um, one of the things that complicates this is cheating can occur in many ways. And in fact, the detailed investigation uh, provided evidence that all three kinds of cheating occur. So, um, one way in which te teachers could cheat uh, is that they have advanced knowledge of what's on the exam and they utilize it to essentially um, go through the, the questions that are going to be in the exam as part of the lessons. Um, and so um, the, the ultimate of uh, teaching to the test uh, is that we teach to the test. Um, uh, in ad uh, addition, you could think of cheating going on during the test. So as I mentioned, the evidence that some teachers have like game answers or signal answers um, during the exam. Uh, they even, there were cases where they purposely sat weaker students next to the better students so that it facilitate the students cheating on one another. Um, 
And then, of course, ex post, uh, there was clear evidence that after the fact, uh, teachers or school administrators changed the answers that they gave. Um, so, uh, the data we have to look at this issue um, with uh, Karen and Jared, um, the great work uh, going into the uh, district's archives and compiling uh, data that did existed, but it had been linked year to year or um, uh, linking students to classrooms, etc. So we basically built a 10 year panel data set from the final data in the system. Um, as I mentioned, there are two types of exam scores. Uh, the high stakes exam, the, the state exam, is given in grades one through eight um, up through 2009-10, uh, and then grades three through eight thereafter. And in, a, in this state, uh, they actually give five different subject area exams. There's math, DLA, reading, social studies, and science. So the ratio data we have only covers DLA, reading, and math. Um, but it's different than many states, you just get a math and reading score. And then uh, we have these low stakes exam scores, and for those, we actually have the item responses, which will uh, be useful to see in a minute. Uh, then kind of the, the usual administrative data, student demographics, attendance, discipline, uh, whether they're in high school diploma, there's um, and then we have this ratio data, but um, it's somewhat limited. So for two years, we only have a ratio data for investigative schools. Um, and then for all schools in the out years, 2010-11 through 11, uh, I should say 12. Um, um, so at first you might think, well, this is you know, straightforward uh, program evaluation, so to speak. Um, we looked at the cheated and uh, compared it to non-cheated, but um, there's actually a lot of complications. So one thing already come up is, how do you identify cheated students? Um, as you'll see in a moment, there's lots of possible ways to find out why we did what we did. Uh, and then, like in most uh, evaluations, determining what's the appropriate counterfactual is difficult. So, as you saw from the previous slide, school, uh, students in the investigated schools, those schools are very different than non investigated schools. Um, the investigated schools, higher minority, higher uh, freedom of use of artist launch, um, than schools where there's no cheating. Um, and presumably, um, the fact that they were cheating, just the school uh, culture was different. The um, principal would choose to manipulate test scores, which is very different than someone who doesn't. Um, and then a third problem is that even within schools, the extent of cheating may be enough. So, um, Typical problem we face with non random assignment of students to classrooms could be relevant here too. That maybe if a uh, principal knows, well, only these teachers are on board with the cheating scheme, uh, I'll put the, the weak students in their classrooms so I know their, their grades, their scores will get cleaned up as the, the uh, term was. Um, and Maybe I know that the TFA teacher isn't on board, so we'll get the better students for that person. Uh, so there's a possibility of non random assignment across classrooms within a school. And then within a classroom, you find evidence that there was selective cheating. That some kids had very few, if any, erasures, and some had as many as 20 erasures on a 60 question exam. Now, part of that is simply better students are going to have fewer wrong answers to correct. But even adjusting for that, it seems that um, there was some variation. Correcting exams is possible. You know, get down there and erase and figure out which answers to bubble in. Um, 
So presumably the teacher would select those students where um, taking the time to correct their answers would have the highest payout. So uh, kids that you know are going to have a really low score, kids you know are going to do well anyhow, just why bother picking up their chances. So and these are all real challenges that we face in trying to evaluate the impact of each teacher. Uh, if you look at the um, literature on identification of cheating on exams, um, there's kind of three types of approaches. Um, one comes out of the Jacob uh, and Levitt paper looking at unusual patterns of responses. So, what the class students did, they all get a block of answers correct, uh, suggesting the teachers went through and said, oh, we're going to fix uh, question six and ten. Um, so for the high stakes exam, we don't have individual item responses. We simply have the, uh, the scale score, the number correct, and the number of wrong directors. So that's not an option in this case. Um, second, Obvious thing would be to look at unusual changes in test scores over time. So if there's sort of sporadic cheating, you would expect if a kid's test score is going along, it bumps up one year and comes back down the next. Um, indeed, that's the kind of story I think that Jacob and Levitt envisioned in their work in Chicago is that, um, I think the paper was entitled something about rotten apples. Um, if you have sort of a teacher here and there that are uh, manipulating test scores, we'd expect kids to, to pop up one year and fall back down the next. But in our scenario, we have some, uh, systemic teaching at the, uh, cheating at these schools, and that it occurred potentially for almost a decade. So you could have students that were consistently cheated um, until uh, exams were monitored and cheating ended. So, unfortunately, looking at variations over time, test scores are probably not going to be a reliable measure of cheating in our uh, case. So, we end up focusing on these wrong to right erasures. Um, what we do is we take the erasure data for 2013, where uh, all evidence suggests there's no longer any cheating going on. Um, we then use that as a benchmark to look at the distribution the right ratios in 2013, we take the 95th percentile and say um, anything over that um, would be suggested of cheating. We then take that number of wrong and right ratios and apply it back to the 2009 test. Uh, so I think it was like five or more ratios in reading the ELA, wrong and right ratios, and six or more in that. Um, the downside of this approach, though, is it, it doesn't capture a sort of ex ante of contemporaneous cheating that we talk about. Um, however, there's an interesting aspect of these exams that helps shed some light on that. It turns out that uh, a high stakes exam was read to students in grades one and two, and students read the questions themselves in grades three and above. <laughs> And uh, as one would expect, it's a lot easier to signal an answer if you're reading out the question. It's by voice inflection, you can infer that it's question B and not C, B, or E. Um, so what we did was to look at the distribution. Yes? In terms of identifying cheated students, it, it seems that the assumption is if there is a certain level of erasures, you're, you're pretty confident that, that there's some cheating going on. Is that not, to, I mean, is that so uh, to discount the probability that students could just be conscientious about or, or, or uncertain of their answers and could be changing their own? I mean, that, that, that could be a possibility, I would argue. Well, so, um, I would argue that uh, the students are uncertain about an answer truly uncertain that if they change it, just as likely they change it uh, 
you know, right to wrong, the wrong to wrong, and it's changing it along the right. Um, and in fact, as you see, the event that um, the, the amount of wrong to right erasures in a non cheating group is pretty small. And uh, we see much greater uh, anti cheating And in, in fact, the later investigation uh, determined that it was clearly organized efforts uh, to receive in racial parties uh, where teachers would get together as a gang and take it to jail. Tim, I just wanted to follow up on Preston's question. And so the way this is framed, it's wrong to write erasure counts. And could you not frame this as the percentage of all erasures that were wrong to write? as opposed to just looking at the wrong to right, because then it gets at this issue of whether there are wrong to wrong erasures, you know, right to wrong erasures. Yeah, I believe, um, yeah, we have the, the count of wrong to right. Um, I don't think we have the total erasures, and I know we don't have the number of wrong to wrong. Or, uh, so, yeah, that's, a, that's probably, we, yeah, in fact, what we do is we construct this um, initial rate measure, which is the um, final number of questions that are answered correctly minus the wrong to right erasures. Now, that doesn't capture um, the, the uh, right to wrong erasures. We assume that those are random. I mean, it would be nice if we had the actual number of you know, initially correct. Um, but here's what the graphs look like. So if you compare second and third grade, and you know, have several other grades in the paper, but uh, you can see that if we compare the 2010 scores to the 2009 scores, there's a clear leftward shift in this quote initial right. For the second graders, not so much for the third graders. It appears that ex ante or contemporaneous cheating was much more severe in grades one and two than in grades three and above. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons were um, that we're going to exclude the lower grades, but it also has the advantage of um, hopefully avoiding most of the ex ante or contemporaneous cheating. Uh, second, yes. So, I would think a lot of teachers would probably be pretty good about counseling their students to leave no questions blank. Did you all discuss, uh, or were you able to see how often questions were left blank? Because that kind of opens up an opportunity if they were likely to be correcting um, wrong answers. Yeah, so um, we do not know the number of that blank. Uh, in fact, there's some evidence that in some cases, also filled in the correct answers that they left blank. We can't measure that. Um, uh, I hope you understand the notion of it. Um, all right, so uh, identifying cheating is one challenge. Another challenge is trying to decide what the comparison group is going to be. Um, as we saw, comparing across investigated, non investigated schools in the Commonwealth with very different populations. Um, so, what we do is to exploit the low stakes exam scores um, as a, a measure of student ability and use that as a way to predict what scores would have been in the absence of cheating. Um, and Believe it or not, there was some anecdotal evidence that may have been some cheating on the low stakes exam. Uh, perhaps teachers were concerned that someone would compare the results. Um, so what we did, since we had item level uh, data on the low stakes exam, we applied the, the methodology developed on Jacob and Levitt to weed out, there weren't many, but weed out uh, cases where there could have been cheating on the low stakes exam. And uh, from that, we then uh, take those scores, uh, which were available in grades three, five, and eight, um, average across, uh, there's a 
really one full board when we have more than one year of data. Uh, we average across time and average across all five subjects using the, the norm uh, reference national percentile score uh, to construct this ability. Uh, because the, the low stakes exam was only available for grades three, five, and eight, that limits our analysis to grades four through eight uh, in uh, later years. So we do drop off a big chunk of the sample, but part of that are lower grade classes where there might have been this exam here for contemporary students. So were you concerned, so in that earlier plot that you showed of the differences between cheated schools and non-cheating schools, um, so there was a big dis difference in race and in free reduced price lunch, but there didn't seem to be much difference in NRT scores between the two groups. Usually um, those things should be fairly correlated, well, right? The, the NRT is the low stakes exam, right. uh, little if any cheating. So I was saying that um, the ability levels were radically different in the two different school types. Um, even though there was disproportion of a minority and low income students. Uh, keep in mind that the, the non investigated schools, we're not talking about like the white suburbs. Um, these are all urban schools, some in bed, better neighborhoods than others. Um, but I was a little surprised the differences weren't bigger, but um, these are still all urban schools with uh, a very heterogeneous mix of students. Um, all right, and then the issue of selective cheating. So, what we did was to construct quintiles of ability based on the low stakes exam, and then look in uh, 2009, spring of 2009, the last cheating year, um, and look at the number of wrong to right erasures by student ability. And you can see that there is a tendency, particularly in, in the fourth and fifth quintile, uh, perhaps that fewer long to right erasures, whether that's because there was less of a race or that teacher was subconscious saying, well, I'm going to focus on kids that really need to be and not really uh, are not going to need proficiency things like that. Um, the asterisks refer to significance relative to the, the lowest quintile. So the fourth and fifth quintiles, the erasures were significantly that different than the lowest quintile. If you look at 2013 for all schools, the era where there was uh, no evidence of cheating. Uh, one, you see that while some are significantly different, the differences are pretty, pretty darn small. So, and if anything, the erasures go up with ability uh, rather than down. So, it seems like uh, in a non cheating environment, there's very little difference in erasures across ability groups. Uh, a very different pattern than cheating. It seems like cheating was happening in all of them. I mean, other schools they had a means compared to this. I mean, the difference in means is pretty striking. So. Yes. Um, so um, there is some evidence there was differential cheating, but clearly, on average, uh, kids of all ability levels, their scores were being manipulated. Yeah, this is on a 60 question exam. It's a difference of, in some cases, on average, seven additional questions uh, due to selection. Um, so to deal with that, we're going to only look at kids who were investigated schools in spring 2009. Um, we include school by grade fixed effects. So we're looking at within school, within grade. So. Um, Washing away any differences even across investigated schools. Um, and the great fixed effects are going to deal with differences in the, the past uh, um, and perhaps differential incentives to cheat if uh, some grades were more important for accountability than others. 
Um, and then in some scenarios, we also include the classroom fixed effects, so computer students are in the classroom. Um, so that would obviously account for endogenous classroom assignment, but it also might exacerbate the selection problem in that if we did have selected cheating by teachers, so they decided, okay, well, I'm not going to bother selecting 25 of the students, but I know these uh, half dozen kids are uh, very poor students, I'm going to fix their exams. Um, that would sort of worsen the selection problem if it's within the classroom. Um, the, the model we use for uh, an adapted uh, value-added model. So uh, if you think of the sort of typical education production function, uh, achievement is a function of all prior uh, home and school-based inputs. Uh, and then uh, uh, typically we include uh, a sort of Characteristics um, and uh, some set of fixed effects to capture things we can't measure directly. Right? Um, in this case, uh, we're limiting the school inputs to the current one year prior. There's very bad evidence that there would be future other school based inputs uh, for the hour over time. Uh, and in fact, the main specification we're actually going to drop those, but in the appendix it was going to change whether or not the ability to work future uh, characteristics um, over the last couple of years. In the case of where a student was cheated according to our definition in 2009, and then uh, that's individual student ability measure, which is the, the average of their most dates um, national percentile scores uh, across the class. So obviously to get there, we had to assume that anything, uh, any inputs before more than two years uh, as prior uh, have no substantial effect. Um, and if we assume that post-cheating assignments are random, so after the cheating occurs, uh, classroom assignments are random, we can eliminate the uh, uh, controls for school-based inputs come back, we leave them in, we take them out, this is not matter. Um, and we're only looking at contemporaneous student characteristics, which most of these are being measured over a number of time, that's the typical idea of school life status. So, um, here are the results from that. Tim, sorry. Yeah. Um, before you start, uh, I, I was just I've been trying to think in my own head what the effects of cheating would be on subsequent student achievement or other kinds of outcomes, and I'm wondering um, what your thoughts on, I mean, what, how should we anticipate um, what these effects might be? Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to postpone answering that because um, several slides later have to represent the results then and we sort of double back and look at what might be some mechanisms. Uh, so. Um, Hold you off the um, because that's actually for the first draft of the paper we kind of started with that is, and then some people told us, well, that's uh, less interesting. We want to know what the effect was, so maybe I should change it back. We can see what people think. Um, so this is still very much malleable, and I'm, uh, I'm hoping to get some help figuring out how to, to uh, revise it uh, in a way that we would like. Um, so here are our, our achievement results, first for math. Um, so looking at the first year after the cheating, so 2009-10, we're monitoring these schools. The ratio data suggests there was some, some sort of residual cheating, but vastly reduced relative to 2000, uh, 2009. And, um, Put in the no fixed effects results as kind of a benchmark to show that yeah, you really need to have some controls for at least for schools. So um, it's not that we believe 
you back earlier on, but just kind of give a lesson from it. What I'm going to say that the school by grade and classroom tick the box model give us uh, very similar answers about six, seven percent of standard deviation, or about the equivalent of having a rookie teacher uh, versus an experienced teacher. So, uh, non trivial, but not humongous. I mean, if that had been 0.4 out of So it's sort of uh, passed the smell test in my view, but of course there's lots of things going on here um, to kind of cancel one another out. Um, but then after that, the results uh, go away. I mean, the point estimates are much smaller, and there is no. So it looks like the math is just kind of a one-time hit, and then they. Um, Uh, different story though for reading at ELA. If we look at reading, uh, we get first year results that are kind of in the same ballpark, uh, 0.08 to, to 0.11 standard deviation reduction relative to what we'd expect based on their ability as measured by Ball State's cleansed uh, test score. Uh, but then it seems to persist um, over time. So the, the school by grade fixed effects, which I think we'd argue are probably the most reliable, um, varies a little bit over time, but it stays in that kind of 0.08 to 0.12 range. Um, grows, apparently grows a little bit uh, in the classroom fixed effects model. But Um, but clearly it's persisting over time in like the math results. Um, and I'd be interested to get your feedback on why that might be a, uh, a not being an education uh, person, being an economist by training. I sort of thought, well, maybe it's that math is um, more disjoint, so get fractions in fourth grade, you get something else in fifth grade, it doesn't um, entirely build on what you had the year before, whereas reading, if you don't get the phonics you know, in, in fourth grade or whatever, you know, just compounds as you go along. And not getting basic concepts of, of reading or um, might have uh, more implications. be the opposite direction, right? Because they, people usually say that math tends to be more a response to school inputs, whereas math or reading outcomes tend to be, you know, reflect both home environment and, you know, school inputs, so. Yeah, that's a good point. I know a lot of the um, work uh, looking at maybe teacher effects or other things, So it's not, though, the impact of the first year is kind of similar magnitude, but it's interesting that it seems to persist in reading and, as we'll see, in the LA. Um, but not in that, but at some level that gives me encouragement that we're not just getting selection effects, because if it was, if this was all selection bias, why wouldn't we see it in all subjects? What percentage of your teachers are Um, good question. Um, now this, these are all exams given in, in grades one through eight, so this is all uh, elementary and middle school. So this is mostly elementary, sort of uh, typical elementary classroom where you have teachers uh, being instructed for all subjects. Uh, but that would be worthwhile to go back and see. Um, To what extent is uh, there a correlation um, between being cheated in math and cheated in reading and language arts? Um, we actually, even though the erasure data is based on proctors, we actually do have student teacher links, so we could you know, also look at the, within a classroom, the actual classroom teacher. So we've got students that have 
Right, you've got student fixed effects, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah. <coughs> And that, I mean, presumably that would be getting rid of whatever selection effects you have, right? Yeah. All right, that's, I just couldn't remember exactly what was going on with the model. Tim? Okay, um, so my question is, you also can construct, I think, a measure of how much a, a student was cheated, right? The extent of being cheated. Um. Not in this version. Uh, so we just, if they exceeded the, the cutoff for the, the 95th percentile of erasures in 2013, uh, and we apply that to 2009, if they're over that, we say they were cheated, we get a binary, cheated, not cheated. Where I was going with it was back to your thought about the effect in reading, and that is, you know, if these kids are sort of low and they're just being brought up to some acceptable level, that's quite different than being low and being brought up to some quite high level. And I'm thinking here about kids may get tracked into subsequent grades. So I get moved from um, a more homogenous group of lower performers into a group that's intended to be a homogenous group of high performers, but I am clearly not a high performer, and therefore I end up being more disadvantaged. And so I'm trying to think about how you could use your data to get at whether the extent of being cheated is actually playing into some of these results. Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a good point. And, um, yeah, that, that would be worth taking a look at. Um, now, I, I, I should point out, it, it wasn't just really low performing students brought up to the, the minimum proficiency threshold. There was uh, at least anecdotal evidence from this detailed investigation that they also brought some uh, students that were meeting the basic proficiency uh, benchmark to the next level, the exceeds uh, level. Because there was apparently pressure not only how many kids could you get to the minimum proficiency, but how many kids could you get to high level. Yeah, I just think the information that you have about individual students and the nature of how cheating was different for them relative to others, that dosage of cheating yeah. might be useful. We're a little worried about um, conflating selection. So if you have a kid who had 20 questions changed, um, well, yeah, maybe there was a greater dose there, but also Maybe we're partly measuring ability of it, uh, but I mean, maybe we can at least put students within sort of you know, minimally cheated versus maximally cheated. Um, I, yeah, I think that'd be worthwhile to get more. Uh, uh, just quickly, you may have mentioned this, um, but how is this distributed across the schools? Where the were the classrooms mostly, like in a given school, all the classrooms were cheating and in another school they weren't? Or was it one classroom in every school was cheating? Okay, so about 60% of the schools had one or more uh, flag classrooms. And then within those uh, schools that had at least one flag classroom, it was really varied. There was some in, you know, in a kind of chart with bins, and, some were like 10% of the classroom, and some were you know, 90, most were kind of in like 20 to 80 percent of the space. It really varied quite a bit. Um, and in fact, if you read the investigative materials that um, in some cases it was specific teachers manipulating scores, in some it was a centralized effort where the test coordinator or the principal uh, or assistant principal was actually uh, changing test scores of, of multiple uh, classrooms. And, and in fact, and there's, so there's stories um, where some teachers like ordered their exams alphabetically so they could easily hand them out the next day. Um, you know, you're, you're doing 
testing over multiple days, and they get their exams back and they're in different order. And so they said, well, we kind of, something's going on here. Nobody's supposed to really do anything to these exams and they're out of order the next day. Uh, so it's not always that the classroom teacher was saying, I'm gonna sit down and change my kids' scores. In some cases, it was a, a central party uh, that was manipulating scores. Um, all right, so we see persistence in these uh, effects in reading the ELA, but not in math. Uh, another outcome we looked at was possible effects on attainment. So the, the last uh, cheating year is spring of 2009. We have enrollment data through fall of 2014. So um, we can track uh, whether kids uh, graduated or still enrolled, though that's somewhat problematic. The reason being that this is district data, a uh, fairly mobile district. So we got uh, enrollment data from the district and graduation data from the district. Also, the state provided this district with information about if a student left their district, do they show up in another district in the state? But we don't know if that student eventually graduated. So if a student was in District A, they moved to District C, um, we know that they moved to District C, but we don't know if they dropped out a year later or graduated. So data is somewhat problematic in that sense. Does the, um, does the state have a graduation exam? students because there were limited subjects uh, and you know the course exams tend to be grade specific so like, uh, some places they'll have ninth grade lit and you know, if you're trying to look at 10th graders it doesn't do any good. Um, uh, so you know, cheating occurred in spring 2009 we can track students for about four or five years after that um, so basically we're looking at kids that were in uh, middle school, late elementary, early middle school, and what happened to them over the next four years. Um, so is there any response by the school of education specifically? Like I wonder if for students in school that cheated, um, did they send extra supports in, for example, or change teachers, fire principals, um, those kinds of things that might. Well, yeah. So, um, uh, I think we approached 200 uh, people were uh, either ended up with uh, resigning or administrative actions or criminal actions. Um, also, there were some sporadic uh, attempts at remediation. Um, there um, is actually going to be a remediation attempt as a, re uh, a result of this analysis. Um, so soon for my own study there next week. Um, 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 so I'm wondering whether um, in the out years, the 10, 11 years, whether you, maybe you've controlled for this, but the teachers with whom these cheated students ended up, were these also um, teachers who may have cheated? Since there's a pretty high within school correlation. Uh, you mean had cheated in the past? Yes. Yes, but unfortunately we can't really, well, we can see if they had, if looking at the cheating teachers in 2009, we could look back and see did they have those, te those teachers prior. So, yeah, that would be worth doing.
So you try and look at, you know, can we get a gauge of you know, how much they've achieved in the past? Yeah, I'm also, I was also sort of interested to know whether there might have been non-random sorting to teachers who had cheated in the past to those cheaters in the future. In some sense, those teachers aren't as good as they might have appeared in the past because they cheated to get whatever their effectiveness was. So I'm a little worried that these kids might, some of those negative outcomes are just the fact that they're being assigned to teachers who would have been more likely to have cheated. Yeah. And that that's the negative outcome, it's just a bad teacher. Uh, yes, and that would be interesting. Now, not only is not only that these teachers weren't dismissed, dismissed right away, so many of them taught the next year um, or the next couple years. Uh, so potentially, we could look at cheating teachers, um, and then you know, in the out years, are they high value added or low value added? Um, it just seems like a robustness check to. Out something that might also explain. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good idea. Um, all right, I'm going to uh, minimize the questions maybe for a few minutes so we can make sure we get going for a minute. Um, all right, so uh, in terms of dropout and graduation, it uh, looks like there may be some effects on dropout, um, though when you throw in the school by grade fixed effects, it goes away. Uh, we started with a probit because we have a better problem to put fixed effects in probit, but the linear probability gives us pretty similar answers, and we throw in fixed effects there, and the results go away. So that's maybe we can suggest some evidence that might have been an impact on, on dropout. Um, so now, finally, getting back to Jim's question. So, what's the story? Um, and we want to at least kind of talk our way through some. One is self-esteem, so that I mean, there's literature uh, looking at how students feel about themselves and its impact on their achievement. Um, presumably, finding out uh, that the high test scores were fake uh, would have a negative effect on your self-esteem. Yeah, I thought it was proficient, but I don't um, And there's, there's some literature uh, connecting self-esteem to uh, educational attainment and the labor market outcomes. Um, if that's the case, though, and getting back to our early discussion, for the most part, students wouldn't have found out that they had been cheated until they get the first true score in spring of 2010. So we shouldn't see, if this is the story, we shouldn't see a negative effects in 2010, purely self-esteem. Not until we learn, and then 2011 and forward. So well, that's not what we found. We found impacts in the first year after cheating. Um, also, we might expect that if it's impacting student self esteem, it plays out in other dimensions. So, and if you're really bummed out that you thought you were a good student, you're not, well, now maybe you're more likely to act out in class, less likely to go to school. And we don't find that. So we ran the same sort of model, looking at percent attendance, no effects. Um, and likewise, if you look at the number of disciplinary incidents, there's nothing there. So it seems that um, it's not affecting areas other than achievement, possibly attainment. Trying to obey the law of the mic. Um, <clears throat> So I, uh, because students don't know that their test put them above the 95th percentile of the right to wrong erasures, sorry, wrong to right erasures in 2013, I have a hard time seeing the potential for picking up any um, self-esteem um, effects in the analysis. And then it seems to me that the most that these students would know is that my school, there was cheating in my school, or maybe my teacher cheated. Um, and so that when you move into either a school by grade or a classroom, you're sort of equalizing that knowledge across the students. Um, and 
so I, if the if the kid doesn't know if you know am I making my my point that I feel like it's it's your given that the self esteem that you're talking about is tied to um, your treatment measure, and they don't know if they are treated. Uh, I'm not sure you can pick up self esteem here. But what if I just struggled that year? I mean, that, that, that sort of saying, okay, I, I'm, a, I'm a good stu I score high, I will always score high. Well, and the other thing, too, that you're also getting great. Um, so, in fact, there were some comments about parents talking about it. Well, something was strange when uh, Johnny is getting the C, but he scores well in the DVD. So, Hard to measure how much information they had. And the other thing is that if they were getting C's in class and um, they got high test scores, is that really boosting their self esteem or did they low Do you have any information on the grades they received? Can you pull that out of the uh, data the district has? But yeah, looking at the difference. Uh, Difference between school grades and um, test scores with the instant. All right. Um, let me follow ahead here. Um, another possible mechanism, so called grade inflation, uh, sometimes talked about in the uh, post secondary world, uh, that some evidence that if students receive grades higher than what's actually justified by their performance, um, it could uh, lead to less demand. So, you know, uh, Professor Smith's in these terms here. Um, so, I'm going to uh, go back to work as well. Um, so, uh, one possible implication is that. Uh, once uh, students uh, know the true performance, they might devote more effort. So if they were kind of slapping off, say, oh, we didn't have proficiency bed marks, benchmarks, uh, and now they realize they are, maybe they, they work a little harder. Um, but uh, in that case, we'd expect that scores would go up uh, relative to expected. So another way to possibly think about it is I know around here that there are many more intervention services around literacy and reading than there are around math. So instead of it being like an effort thing that it might just be along the lines of what Jim's saying in terms of like sorting down the road that like it sends a signal to parents or to the school that students don't need those services that they in fact need and if there's a disparity between the services offered in literacy and math that could have those kinds of differential effects that you see. Yeah, and two more slides. Okay. Uh, uh, third possibility, maybe it's affecting up early, uh, teacher margin, or whatever you want to call it, uh, um, that if the teacher knows, well, uh, I'm going to clean up these exams after the fact, Less incentive to give uh, true instruction. Uh, though, if that were the case, if it's class wide instructional effort, then we should see all students' um, scores be worse. Um, in fact, we can see a lot of variation within classroom, though it's possible they could have said, well, gee, um, I know the really struggling students. Are Clean up their exams so while teach in the middle of other part of the class. That's possible as well. But in fact, you know, if we looked at the cl within classroom estimates, um, they're certainly not smaller than the across class estimates. Um, and then finally, I'm going to this point that um, one possible mechanism is simply by inflating the scores. Kids miss out on the mediation they would have otherwise received. So 
So uh, in many cases, remediation is based on your score on the, the state achievement test. Uh, many states retention uh, is tied to the test scores. Uh, in fact, there are a number of studies, mostly regression discontinuity studies, look at it just a thumb below the threshold and find some positive effects of uh, various forms of remediation, you have retention, summer school, etc. Although it seems like most of the effects are elementary school, and then high school interventions seem to be less effective. Um, so if that's happening, achieved students should be taking fewer intervention services. Um, within the district, uh, we can look at two measures. One is grade retention. And then second, we actually had um, what they called an early intervention program where students that were not meeting expectations on the state exam, um, at the, at primarily at the elementary level, would then receive the suite services, uh, uh, tutoring, um, so forth. Um, if you look at the probability of being retained um, the, the next year, that Kids that were cheated were less likely to be retained. There's no big surprise there, but we're getting played, so if you're basing your attention on the uh, reported scores, then relative to what they expect based on their, their baseline, most states retain scores, less likely to be retained. And this um, early intervention program. Um, we also see that, at least uh, without the fixed effects, um, it's less likely that they receive these intervention services um, if they have been cheated. So it seems like one possible mechanism is that um, they miss out on interventions they would have received uh, otherwise. And if you have suggestions, Um, so, um, uh, just to sum up here, uh, with what appear to be negative effects on student achievement, uh, the persisting reading area ELA, but not in math, uh, on the order of once a big time, the impact, the typical impact of having a lucky teacher versus an experienced teacher. So, um, quantitatively important, but not. Uh, some suggestive evidence that it may have impacted dropout at the high school level, but I you know, wouldn't hang my hat on that. Uh, no effects on the um, attendance or discipline. And it looks like a likely mechanism is failure to see the mediation. Um, so kind of going for a full circle back to the first question about what does this mean for policy? Um, so um, teacher cheating is one of the potential unintended consequences of high school accountability. Um, and I think that would suggest that that can have negative effects on student performance. Um, does that mean we should um, do away with high stakes testing or uh, severely limit the, the grades and subjects tested? Uh, I don't think necessarily so. Um, as Jim and others have shown uh, pretty convincingly, that there are some positive effects of accountability. So, accountability, as you can see, has uh, led to weeding out of um, low quality teachers to high quality teachers that uh, I guess this picture I saw at APAM but uh, suggests it has positive effects for student achievement. Um, so you really have to look at the well, costs and benefits. I think in the current debate many people are focusing on the cost of testing and more the possibility that there are benefits from testing and you got to weigh the two. Our work is just suggest yeah, there's one of the many ways in which testing can have negative effects, but they may not consider the positive effects in, in making evaluation the optimal amount of testing.
sorry. You mentioned that one of the most likely mechanisms was the exclusion from needed remedial services, but you also mentioned that this was occurring among all groups of students. I would assume that those who had previously been in the lowest um, quintiles would be the most likely to have those services. So I wonder about the effects on those, on those students who weren't there and were never getting those services and were never missing them necessarily in the first place. Now, one problem we have is that we don't know the scale score in the absence of the issue. So, we know their actual scale score, we know the number of lights, um, the, and the number of all the right issues. So, I'm guessing we could reverse engineer uh, and all the different questions get different weights on the scale of the And we don't know if we can do the response. So, we might be able to kind of come up with a proxy for the scale score.
may that would be sort of a measure of um, what, what, how dedicated a student they are or something? Or? <laughs> Location, probably staff. Uh, my guess is it's scheduled beginning at two. Um, so thanks very much, Tim.